and if anyone is late, then it's his fault. Uh, okay, so uh, the title of my presentation today is Self-Driving Cars. Before we actually dig into the uh, subject, I wanted to comment uh, briefly why this subject. And I think that uh, you might be wondering, because usually the things that uh, we talk on presentations at Infusion are a bit different than something as general as this one. So uh, the reason for me delivering this talk is that uh, I had the pleasure of uh, attending something uh, which is called the Singularity University Summit in Spain. And it's basically a conference which uh, goes over a bunch of technologies that for some reasons that I will mention shortly are important for, uh, for the future of, of mankind, <laughs> uh, to, say, uh, to say shortly. Uh, this is not a single uh, presentation that I'm going to deliver. There, there will be additional ones delivered by uh, um, all distinguished engineers, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, for additional content, uh, and uh, and basically you will be able to uh, to hear about some interesting uh, ideas uh, coming from different parts of uh, uh, of technological world. Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, to rephrase uh, uh, Professor Farnsworth from Futurama, I could say good news, everyone. Uh, the singularity is near. I don't know if any one of you recognizes the gentleman on the picture but his name is Ray Kurzweil. And uh, I would say that uh, it is fair to describe him as a, a technological visionary. Uh, he's a person who is trying to figure out how the world will look like uh, in a couple of years to a couple of decades. And one of the main ideas that he presents is that at some point in time, in near future, there will be a singularity uh, happening. And by singularity, he means that the pace of, develop, of the development of technology and its complexity will be so high that no single person will be able to comprehend it. So what in practice it means is that technology will reach some point, some threshold, and after reaching that point, we will no longer actually control it. And the consequences of that are pretty significant. Uh, some people are scared about those. Uh, some people are actually pretty optimistic. I think that Ray is actually uh, on the side of those who are optimistic. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, uh, over what singularity and whether it's the same as a super intelligence or something different. Uh, I encourage you to actually look into his presentations or books because it's really worth, uh, worth uh, reading about. Now, uh, one important aspect of uh, his idea that I wanted to bring here is uh, something which he calls exponential growth and exponential technologies. So what he's saying in like many different talks is that if you look at the technologies in general, you can uh, uh, point out two classes. The first uh, are those technologies uh, which develop in, uh, in uh, linear fashion, so basically those are the technologies that are usually mature and the enhancements in whatever aspect of this technology is linear. So uh, yes, it's uh, very uh, usable. Uh, people uh, buy uh, this particular technology. Uh, however, nobody actually expects any revolution uh, in regards to the, this particular technology. So those are the linear technologies. And if you look at like different examples that he gives, those are usually technologies which are developed by big companies and enhancements are mainly due to some optimization process that is happening in the, in the companies. Uh, on the other hand, there is a second class of technologies which are called exponential technologies. And the main idea behind those is that the enhancement of those technologies are happening in exponential manner. And it actually has two consequences. The first one is that when the technology is first announced or described, uh, it usually uh, is met with disappointment. So I would say that uh, augmented reality is probably something which right now is like in a disappointment area on this graph here. So uh, yeah, we all like the idea of augmented reality. It sounds uh, that it, it will be very uh, useful. There are a gazillion of potential uh, applications. However, if you look at the Google Glass, you say, eh, yeah, like it's nice, but I won't buy it. Not yet, right? So that's because it's, it's still in the development. However, what makes a particular technology important is that uh, 
if it grows at a steady rate, uh, then it grows in an exponential fashion. And what happens is that at some time uh, in the future, it will reach a point when it, it is as usable as other technologies that compete with it. And starting from that point, it will accelerate uh, way faster than anything that's on the market. So uh, basically, it says that w when this point uh, is reached, uh, it becomes a revolution because uh, it becomes very, very quickly uh, a way more usable, a way more user friendly, a way more efficient than anything else that's on the market. And the competition usually do not have any time to react at that point because they are developing in a linear fashion. Now, as I said, I had the pleasure of attending Singularity University Summit, and it's actually an organization that has been founded by Ray Kurzweil. And the idea behind that is, A, to identify exponential technologies that have potential to bring revolution, and then bring the knowledge about those technologies to a broader uh, audience. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the conference uh, was held this year in Sevilla, and one of the themes that were, was described there was self-driving cars. And uh, the reason why I picked up the talk, uh, basically self-driving cars, uh, is the fact that I was a bit skeptical uh, at the beginning, or actually even more than a bit skeptical, but I heard some arguments that, uh, in my opinion, are really worth considering, and uh, are good uh, incentives or indications that uh, self-driving cars are actually exponential technologies that uh, have a big potential of of changing, uh, changing uh, the way uh, we live. Okay, so uh, let's go into uh, into the main, like the core of the presentation. Uh, it will be about self-driving cars, and what I want to do at the beginning is look at the technology and its development from the historical perspective. Uh, so I would say that probably the first effort to build and test. Uh, self-driving car was something which was called DARPA Grand Challenge and that was something which was announced in 2004 and the idea before uh, behind DARPA Grand Challenge was pretty simple uh, the idea was or the task was build a self-driving car no human intervention allowed whatsoever that will be able to drive 240 kilometers uh, along Interstate 15, uh, which is on the border between California and Nevada. And basically it means that that's the desert. So the idea was, okay, build a car in whatever technology you like and make it drive 240 kilometers throughout the desert uh, with the constraint that you need to complete the track within 10 hours. So let me give you just a very, very short video uh, sorry, a very, very, very short video uh, that shows uh, how that looked in practice. I am not going to show you everything, but I just want to show you, uh, like, an example, example cars. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we don't hear the, uh, the sound. However, uh, I will do the comments. So you can see that they are not driving very fast. Actually, they are driving very, very slow. Uh, they are not driving in a straight lines. Uh, at some point, they they can stop or they stopped for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, you will see uh, in a second that uh, from uh, quite a few competitors, only uh, very very few of them bring something meaningful. This is my favorite. Uh, oops. <laughs> That's a problem, right? Uh, so yeah. This is how it looked in 2004. So uh, unfortunately, you do not uh, hear the speaker, but the guy uh, is saying that that was a great effort, uh, which <laughs> probably means that it was a, a failure. Uh, OK, but let's actually see uh, how that turned out uh, next year. So there was a second DARPA challenge, which was held in 2005. And here's a comparison. Uh, in 2004, you had 100 teams. Uh, the farthest distance that was driven by any team was 12 kilometers. That was how far they could go. So it's like seven miles. And there obviously was no winner announced. And that was not because there was like a close competition, but basically because everyone failed. Uh, yeah, a question. Uh, what was the reason that this distance was so short? Uh, I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they blocked somewhere. Maybe they didn't. Uh, uh, they were not able to uh, go over some obstacle. Maybe they were driving uh, not fast enough. Maybe they uh, basically went off the tracks. Uh, I, I don't know what was the reason, but probably there was not a single one because there were like 100 teams. So probably the the reasons were different uh, for different teams. Uh, now, when you compare that to 2005, you had uh, twice the amount of, uh, of teams. And actually, five of the cars that uh, competed in the competition uh, completed that. Uh, and the winner's average speed was 34 kilometers per hour, which is not very, like, very fast, but it enabled the team to finish the track in uh, around seven hours. So even in the period of one year, uh, the technology uh, was developed or enhanced in such a manner that actually this was, this was possible. Okay, <sighs> great. In, in 2005, we had a self-driving car that was able to go through a desert. Okay. Uh, with the other... Yeah. On this 100 teams from 2004, yeah. any of those teams completed, completed the course in 2005? Because there, there might be like new teams with a really good technology that okay. completed for the first time. And so I would have to verify that, but I believe that the winning team in 2005 was Stanford Racing Team, <coughs> and they competed in 2004. Okay. It wasn't like a, a different team that appeared from nowhere, or it was not taking part uh, in the competition a year before, but it was basically an enhancement to something which, uh, which. Uh, Worked a year before. Without that, we can't say that it was an enhancement. Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, the big track that you've seen in DARPA Challenge 2004 was among one of the five teams that completed the course as well. Okay. So, I believe that at least three that I remember uh, were enhancements, uh, basically the same team that did uh, improve the, uh, the, their technology. Uh, okay, so as impressive as it might seem, uh, like if we look at the facts, it's, it's okay. Like. Uh, we can drive through the desert. Probably there are not that many people there. OK, there might be some obstacles, but there are no other humans involved. So OK, it's it's good, but probably it's uh, a long distance from self-driving cars in the infrastructure that we have. So let's go fast forward to 2015. Now, what we have in 2015 is Google Car. So you may or may not know that Google is developing its own self-driving car. It's not available on the market. However, research is more or less open, so we can compare what their car is able to do 10 years from the first DARPA challenge, or actually 11 years. So what they are able to do is they are able to drive in urban area and share road with other human drivers. So it's not a desert anymore. Like, you are not on your own in some space. Like, you have to actually coordinate your efforts with other people who are on the road as well. They are able to detect obstacles and pedestrians and actually predict that the pedestrian is about to do something which potentially might be dangerous. They can change lanes. They can read traffic lights. They can do actually quite a few tasks that in 2005 were, like, totally out of, out of question. So just in 10 years, in my opinion, the development of the technology was really, really significant. And to one of the questions, actually, the team who is developing a Google car uh, is mostly built from the guys who won the DARPA challenge uh, in 2005. So basically, Stanford Racing team uh, like had five people, three of those are working for Google, Google right now and are developing a self-driving car technology. So, like, 10 years, in my opinion, the, uh, the improvement is really, really significant. Now, the other interesting thing uh, about the uh, Google Car is that uh, they are actually able to equip more or less, like, every car there is uh, because it's all about the sensors that they have and data processing. So, uh, to the public knowledge, there is about 10 instances of Google self-driving cars. Uh, however, among those, there is uh, some which are Toyota, some which are, uh, which are Audi, and some which are Lexus. So it's not only Toyota Prius, which is usually like shown on the news, but actually they have different different types, different brands of uh, of cars that they can use for for self driving. 
Okay, so let's look at the technology for a second. Uh, I said that uh, like Google self-driving car is basically uh, sensors and data processing. It's not that much about the uh, mechanics of the car itself. Uh, one interesting thing that I want to uh, point out is the thing that it's mounted on the roof of the car, and it's called a uh, LiDAR. So it's laser equivalent of ra uh, radar, and what it does, it basically spins very, very fast, and it's doing a mapping, a laser mapping of the surroundings of the car, which results in a real-time 3D map of the surroundings of the car. So uh, to my knowledge, that's, that's one of the key, like, one of the essential sensors that they are using right now. What they have uh, in addition uh, is a camera which is mounted just by the rear view mirror which is looking at what's happening on the road. They also have a bunch of sensors on the front and back bumper which are used for uh, detecting if something is like happening in the short distances and long distances as well because the uh, uh, the accuracy of uh, LADAR is about 30 meters, whereas sometimes you want to have like a, a look uh, further in the, uh, in the front of the car. So, so this is uh, what they are using. And uh, the, uh, the last sensor that they have is something which is mounted on the uh, back uh, wheel, and it's used for estimating uh, what was the distance traveled. So they can use that uh, sensor data to actually uh, point the location in the space in a very, very precise way. Now, uh, what they do is they put all the data from those sensors together to create like a, a model, a computational model of reality to figure out how to drive. And uh, a visual, like one of the visualizations of the uh, uh, of the model uh, is something like that. So what you can see here is that in the left bottom corner. Uh, bottom corner, uh, you have a view from the camera which is just by the driver's head. So you can see that there is some car which is actually changing the lane to the lane on which the Google cry, uh, car is driving. And in the main area of the image, you can see what is the 3D model of the whole thing. So uh, as a model, it's a simplification of reality. For instance, any other cars which are uh, right now uh, traveling in the uh, near distance are just a 3D blobs but apparently that's just good enough. Uh, and you can see that one of the blobs is actually the car which is changing the lane. Uh, and for a very short period of time, you have like a warning indicator that probably it goes into, uh, a, like it's on a collision course with, uh, with the car that it's uh, uh, driving right now. So like this is more or less what is, uh, what is happening. Are they, are they using any additional data sources like Google Maps or something like that? So I will talk about that actually on the next slide. So once once more, it's cool. Technology is like very impressive. impressive. However, like still we are not there when it comes to self-driving cars. And uh, okay, let's talk about limitations uh, uh, at the beginning. So one hidden piece that I didn't talk about here is that, okay, we have a sensors and we have streams of data coming from the sensors that we are like mashing up in some way. However, what is happening is that this data is combined with ultra high precision maps. And th those are not maps that you are used to like Google maps. Those are actually a 3D scans of a reality, one could say. So it's like uh, precise to, a, to an inch level. Uh, what they are using that for, for instance, uh, they can figure out what is the height at which the uh, traffic lights are hanging so that they can actually quickly figure out what is the, uh, uh, the light, whether they can cross the, uh, the crossing or not. So this is, this is one, one piece of the data, which uh, to my knowledge is not actually uh, stored in the card itself, but it's actually taken from the uh, uh, server farm with which the car is connected. Now, uh, that brings uh, another limitations. Basically, if you don't have a connectivity, then uh, the car enters something which is called the safety mode, uh, which turns it to a car from DARPA Challenge 2004. <laughs> uh, uh, now, uh, the other limitations that they have is uh, they do not obey the temporary lights because they don't know where the light is or the uh, the process of figuring out, detecting it on the image is not efficient enough to do it in uh, real time. Uh, they have trouble with identifying harmless obstacles. 
So for instance, if you are driving a car and you see a debris, you are able to say, okay, I can actually go through it and we should be fine, or no, I actually need uh, like uh, buy it. Uh, Google Car uh, doesn't know how to do it. So sometimes it stops or like uses brakes when normal person would not do that. Uh, okay, uh, other ad hoc situations with which Google Car is not dealing uh, with right now uh, is, for instance, a police officer, officer signaling uh, to stop. So, like, Google Car will not stop if the policeman is waving at you. Like, no, no question about that. Uh, there are a bunch of other problems that are exi that exist right now. For instance, uh, the, uh, like weather condition. This is not something that Google Car is dealing with uh, in an efficient way. For instance, if there is a heavy snow or uh, a lot of rain, it basically uh, fails to operate correctly. Now, this is something which works right now. Uh, if you go to a Silicon Valley, you can see it physically uh, driving by, uh, passed by you. What Google is saying that somewhere between 2017 and 2020, they want to actually ship it on the market. Uh, it's not very uh, obvious what it means because at some point Google was claiming that they don't want to build cars but just to offer a technology to uh, automotive industry. Right now they are actually building or prototyping their uh, own car from scratch, so they might have changed their mind, but we will basically <laughs> see, see uh, how will that look. Okay. Uh, when it comes to research, which is done right now and works right now, it's not only Google. Uh, it's a bit of a paradox that the most innovative uh, company in the industry is not, not a company that builds cars or sells cars. But if you think about the exponential technologies, it actually makes sense because like, they are like, from a different domain and they think differently. They have the, uh, the advantage of, uh, of, uh, of not being like, sealed within the market. However, uh, all the big players on the market right now are figuring out uh, what does it mean to have a self-driving car and what do they want to offer to their customers. So for instance, Audi says, okay, we are going to bring you a self-driving experience. However, it's not meant to uh, substitute the, the driver. So they are saying, don't worry, you still be needed. However, if uh, for a safety reason or because the driving task is boring, you are going through a motorway or highway, uh, then you can switch to autopilot mode and the car will drive by itself. What they are saying is that technology will be available uh, to the end user in about 10 years. So that's the perspective that they are looking at, but they are <coughs> not saying anything about uh, self-driving cars only. It's like something in addition to something that you have already. The second company which is, uh, in my opinion, worth uh, mentioning is BMW. And what BMW has is uh, a technology which is called Remote uh, Wallet Parking Assistant. And it's something pretty similar to uh, what Google has when it comes to mapping uh, of the reality. Uh, what they are saying is, okay, let's imagine that you go to a shopping mall. Uh, you enter the parking, you get out of the car and say, okay, park yourself. And the car will actually go around the parking, find an empty place and park there. When you end the shopping, it will pick you up. And that's actually working. So there is a like, presentation or a video on the YouTube that you can see uh, this thing happening in reality. Now, the big assumption is that the parking lot has to be scanned first. So basically, they have a like ultra precise uh, uh, model of the parking that the car is park, uh, going through. So like that's some limitation, but like still, it's it's happening right now. And what they are saying is, it will be available to the end user in uh, somewhere between five to eight years from now. Uh, Audi and BMW are not the only uh, the only uh, car manufacturers that are thinking about self-driving cars. You have Volvo, you have Nissan, you have Mercedes-Benz, and others, uh, and like they are doing very very similar things. So this is what is happening in the research right now. Uh, okay, but let's think about something maybe not as complicated, but something which is available to an end user right now. Uh, 
what you have on the market right now are the pieces of the technology that will be used in the self-driving cars in the future, whether you like, whether you know about it or not. So, for instance, you have adaptive cruise control, you have automatic collision avoidance, you have lane keeping, you have night vision, you have blind spot detection, and like bunch of other things here, which like in the near future will be a part of self-driving car technology. What's more. There has been a survey done by uh, JD Power, uh, which is basically like a big survey company in the US and uh, in the UK. And what they are saying is that if you survey people who are drivers uh, about the features that they like the most in their cars, the things that are parts of self-driving car experience are just on the top. So it means that people love the features that will be available in a better, more flexible, in a safer way in the self-driving cars. So maybe it's a like a far-fetched conclusion, but uh, probably what will happen is that people will love the features that the self-driving self cars bring them. So that's one of the arguments that self-driving car technology can actually succeed in practice. Okay, just to finish off uh, the technological part. We know where we were in 2005, 2004, we know what is done in research right now, what is available on the market. The plot that I'm showing you is something which shows what is the possible development of the technology in the near future. And interesting fact is that there is actually a taxonomy of uh, self-driving car levels, which here are denoted as L1, L2, L3, up to L5. And uh, those are like enhanced versions of self-driving car experience. So we can see that right now in 2005, we have things like adaptive cruise control, uh, autonomous braking, that's many systems. We have park assist. This is something which exists right now. And it's regarded as level one. We are there already. Now, uh, somewhere around 2020, what should happen is that we will have a technology of the autopilot. And we will be able to use autopilot in a constrained number of environments. So for instance, if you are uh, in a traffic jam, you will be able to say, OK, let's do an autopilot. You will be able to read the book, and it will follow uh, the car just in front of you. Or if you are going through a highway, you will be able to say, OK, now just take over. I want to do something else. So on the level three, you will have autopilot, so self-driving car, but in a constrained environment. And that should be available like somewhere somewhere around 2020. At least those are the predictions. Uh, now, what will happen next is L4, which is full self-driving car. So it means that there will be a technology which, which will enable us to do a self-driving thing. However, the car that you will be driving will have an override mode. So whenever like something wrong happens or you want to take over, you will be able to control the car on your own. Finally, you have a L5, which is self-driving car only. So it's a car that is fully controlled by some uh, operational unit, and the person sitting inside won't be able to control it at all. So it, it will be forbidden for people to drive a car? Uh, because it will be safer to have a self-driving We will car. come to that, but I think that in practice it will mean that you won't have, there will be no uh, like driving wheel <laughs> or no pedals. Basically, there will be no thing inside that would allow you to control your car. It would be like uh, a room on a wheels, basically. Google so, made it uh, already in the prototype. There yeah, that's no true. That's true. And I, I will talk about it in a, uh, in a, in a few minutes. But just one, one last note about the graph that I'm showing you right now. Uh, is that it's not that far in the future. Like, I know those are predictions, it might be totally wrong, but it seems that so far the predictions were pretty right, and the predictions tell us that somewhere around 2025, so 10 years from now, more or less, we will have a technology which will enable us to have self-driving cars. So basically it's 10 years, the same period that it took uh, the first car from DARPA Challenge to be able to drive on its own in a Silicon Valley. I think that, like, I could believe in that. Like, that's that, that's my personal opinion. Okay, cool. So we know uh, a few things about technology. I hope that after looking at the technology, uh, at least to some extent, you believe that 
it's technically feasible to build a self-driving car. Now the question is, is technology, is technology enough to actually uh, make the revolution happen? So I can build something. Now the question is, A, can I sell it? B, will I be enabled to sell it? C, will people like it? Right? So like, uh, is business, business model of self-driving car attractive enough to make the revolution happen? Okay, so let's let's look at some at some potential benefits. Uh, so the first benefit is pretty obvious, I believe, and it's safety. So if you think about self-driving cars, uh, like uh, the way that you uh, that you could argue that they are uh, safer is this: like any task that is done automatically can be done more precisely and more re reliably than any human being can do it. So assuming that we can automate the process of driving, which will be a challenge, but let's say that we do it, when it's done in an automatic way, it will be way safer than any human driver. <coughs> so imagine that if the uh, cars are driving on their own, there are no people that are drunk who are driving. There are no people who are stressed, uh, who are nervous, who are depressed. Uh, Tired. Sorry? Tired. Tired, yeah, exactly. Like all of those reasons for which there are car accidents will not be valid anymore. It will be a machine which is driving, right? Now, another interesting aspect of this thing is that right now in Sweden, what they are saying is that uh, they are starting a governmental program which is uh, about to eliminate all fatal accidents on the road by, I believe, 2020 something. So what they are saying is that uh, by regulations, still having a human drivers, we can eliminate all fatal accidents on the roads whatsoever. Like zero people dying on the roads, okay? There might be some accidents which are not fatal, but like no, no, no human casualties. Now, imagine uh, that you put self-driving cars on top of that. Like that would be a magnitude of like, magnitude uh, safer than what they can do in, uh, in Sweden right now. So, like, I'm pretty sure that that self-driving cars are going to to be a way safer than what we have right now. Okay, the second thing, uh, and that's something that we uh, that we touched uh, uh, when we were talking about how to take over the car, and there are actually like two ideas right now on the market. If you look at what like Audi, BMW, Volvo, Nissan, or any other uh, 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 any other company uh, in the automotive industry is showing is that, okay, you have the car which looks exactly the same as the car that you have right now, but you have this magic button, and when you, when you press the magic button, the wheel will drive on its own, the pedals will move automatically, that's basically it. So we can see the lady on the left-hand side, that it's like uh, in a car, probably somewhere in the Germany, she's going to Berlin, and she's not driving, but she's reading a, a magazine. Like, interesting. Like, I want that, right? But now imagine if the car can drive on its own, like, why should we build the car interior in the same way as we did for, like, last century? When you think about it, it doesn't make sense. Like, if the car can go on its own, why do we have, like, two seats in front and two seats, seats in the back, and we are facing, we are not facing each other, but, like, we are uh, in this weird position, uh, everyone looking forward. Why not change the interior of the car to be as any other room that you can be in, right? So you can rearrange the interior totally. Like you can have a, a, a seats which are facing each other, so we can talk normally. <coughs> you can have uh, like uh, a table, for instance. Uh, you can have an access to the internet, and you can have a desk that will enable to, you to work. Uh, you can have a different settings inside for different purposes that you may or may not want. So, uh, looking from the work perspective, let's assume that I'm commuting one hour each day uh, to get to work. And let's assume that I can spend the time effectively working. It means that, like, at the moment when I'm entering my car, it's the same as if I was entering my office. So the commute time is not wasted anymore, right? 
I can actually open my PC, start typing, start typing code. I can connect to a video conference if that's necessary. It's like something called it a Pursman teleport. And I think that it's a pretty good description because like it moves you from one place to the other without you being like bothered in, in any way, right? Uh, what else can you do? Uh, you can have uh, inside of the car uh, created for different purposes. <clears throat> Let's say that it, you are going to a concert. You can have like interior which will enable you to I don't know listen to the uh, uh, listen to the uh, recordings of the uh, artists that you are going to see, or you are going to a football match and you will be watching uh, on TV uh, like analysis of the recent matches. Like sky is the limit. But basically, the idea is that you can think about self-driving car as a room on wheels, like poor man's teleport. And I think that this is a huge uh, game changer. When that's available, I want to have one. Uh, cool. Uh, next thing. Uh, the next thing is mobility. Now, uh, here thing is a bit, a bit more complicated, I would say. Uh, until now, what we are like discussing was a self-driving car as a single unit, single independent unit. Now, let's assume that we enhance the idea a bit and we put a Uber-like uh, company on top of that. So let's assume that we have Uber, or actually let's assume that Uber has the self-driving cars. So they do not have drivers, they have a fleet of cars that can go around the city that is controlled in an algorithmic way. Uh, what it means? Well, I would say that it means that many people do not need cars anymore. Uh, why is that? Uh, the reason is that like, for very uh, cheap amount of money or very small amount of money, you can have a mobility service inside a city. So let's say that I want to go from place A to B. Uh, I can order uh, an Uber car just like any other car that, uh, that is there. However, that car can be tailored for my needs for this particular trip. So right now, if you have a taxi driver, the guy owns the car, right? So probably he uses it for some other reason, so he has an ordinary car. But let's assume that nobody else from Uber is using this car. What it means is that if I commute to work, I can actually go with a car which has a single seat in it, nothing more. So I can actually use something which is called a green cars, which run on different fuels. But important fact about them is this. Right now, they cannot enter the market because nobody will buy it. Uh, if I'm buying a car, I'm thinking, OK, what is the most exotic scenario that I want to support? If I want to go skiing, I will need this and this amount of money, that many, uh, this and this amount of, uh, uh, of place. Uh, this many seats, so I will buy a big thing. I won't buy a single single person unit because I know that like in many cases it won't be enough. However, Uber Uber will have an economical incentive to actually buy a single single seat unit because it will make sense for them. Now, interesting fact about this those like small green cars is that they are very energy efficient and actually they are more efficient than public transportation right now. So. If you would have a fleet of those cars, it would make more sense to get all the people from the bus or from the subway and put them in those those units and um, uh, let them uh, drive without, those without units. Without taking the traffic into consideration. Without taking the traffic, the, yeah, yeah. But actually, okay, that's a good point. But right now, a lot of traffic jam is caused by the fact that people are driving like as a single person. If you have a single unit, potentially the space will be like uh, used in a more efficient way. At least, at least that, that might be the arg argument. Now, uh, another interesting thing about the mobility is that you can have an uh, alternative source of energy for a car. Right now, what is happening is that uh, the cars that uh, drive on a gasoline have a great infrastructure for supplying energy. So if you are in a city, you have a thousand, uh, like a whole bunch of uh, uh, gas stations that you can use. If you buy an electric car in Poland, you are basically in a bad spot, I would say, because uh, you can probably charge it only uh, at home, right? So the distance that you can travel is not that much. 
what is happening with a fleet of algorithmically uh, uh, controlled cars is that they can actually charge themselves or go to a charging station uh, like when they are free. So you do not have to uh, think about recharging your car. This is something which system will does will do automatically for itself. Uh, so I think that like any alternative source of energy that can be used uh, is uh, very interesting from that from that perspective. Uh, okay. Uh, one last thing when it comes to the mobility and the system like Uber with self-driving cars is that if I don't own, own any car and uh, if they drive automatically, it probably means that they do not need parking spots in the cities. So let's imagine that you live in a city in which you do not need any parking spots because the fleet of the Uber cars will stop, but they will do that in the suburbs, right? Like the landscape of the city will change dramatically as well. There will be a lot of areas which will be regained for the uh, society to use, probably to build another block of flats, but hopefully a park or like green area, right? So the potential is there. Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, the next uh, incentive is is economy. Actually, I touched on many things that uh, that are connected to the economy before, but just to say it one more time. Uh, first of all, probably we will be able to use the cars will be tailored for a particular use. And there are some calculations which say that if in America right now, every person would use uh, a car uh, that would have features needed only for this particular moment in time. So let's say that in the US there are no pickups, pickup trucks, <clears throat> but people actually uh, get a car that they need right now. US would not have to import any gasoline. So that would be the change in the consumption of, uh, of gasoline in the US. So that's very, very significant for the economy. Secondly, uh, well, it, it can be seen as advantage and disadvantage, but probably a lot of jobs will be lost or w maybe not will be lost, but will disappear. So uh, if you can have a self-driving car, why should you uh, hire a person to do that like for you. Uh, the machine will be cheaper, it will be more re reliable. Like From the economical perspective, it makes more sense to have a self-driving car. Uh, finally, another uh, economic incentive for self-driving cars is this. Let us, let's assume that I'm really, really, really stubborn. And I really, really want to drive my car on my own. What it probably will mean is that I will pay a lot higher insurance than other people. And the reason is that I won't be as good driver as a self-driving car, so the insurance company will ask me to pay way more for my insurance. So people will, ha will have a very direct <coughs> economical incentive to use self-driving cars and not drive on their own. So that's that's uh, additional argument here. Okay. The last benefit that I would like to, to tell about is logistics. You probably know that some time ago Amazon was trying to uh, to figure out how to deliver goods, uh, small small packages, uh, to the end users with drones. Now that didn't work really well in the U.S. mainly to the uh, political pressure. Uh, in the end, there was a law which actually allowed to use drones for goods delivery, but the constraints were so big that it doesn't make sense, at least right now. Let, let's imagine that you have a self-driving unit that you can use for goods delivery. <clears throat> what it means in practice is that you can deliver goods A faster and B cheaper. So uh, it may turn out that Amazon will not use drones, but at some moment somebody will use self-driving cars for delivery of goods. Because if we can get on the market or if we can legally drive uh, or let dri uh, cars drive on their own, there is no reason why they cannot like uh, bring us goods. And that will change the logistics in retail uh, a lot as well. Okay, so those were uh, the, uh, the benefits. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, I'm a person who believes that this revolution will happen sooner or, or later. Uh, 
and I think that the biggest uh, reason why that will happen are the enormous benefits that we will get. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the technology will be there, uh, and I'm pretty sure that even if there are any problems, uh, the benefits will be so high that somebody will decide to uh, to use self-driving cars. Now, let's talk about potential challenges or potential obstacles. I don't know if you if you recognize the uh, the photo uh, or from which story it was taken. So there is something which is called a General Motors uh, streetcar conspiracy. So uh, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's something which actually happened uh, in reality uh, in 1950s. So in North America, just after the war, there were a lot of streetcars. So the system was pretty well developed at, for that moment in time. Uh, what happened is that uh, General Motors and a bunch of other uh, companies from the automotive industry, they uh, combined their efforts to first buy uh, like majority of streetcars uh, companies and then uh, bankrupt them on purpose. So basically what they wanted to do is like destroy the streetcars uh, street uh, industry because that was a threat to automotive industry uh, in the uh, public transportation uh, domain. <clears throat> so right now, if you go to the uh, North America, you won't see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, 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 streetcars. And if you see those, they are usually no competition to other means of public transportation. They are they're probably just, just as a, for fun or to, uh, touristic uh, amusement. So it's possible that it may happen. It may happen as well to a self-driving car. Uh, it is possible that the industry would say, "Would say, okay, let's combine the forces and let's make sure that this will not ever happen." Uh, I believe that yes, that's possible, but probably only on the area of uh, a single country. So I believe that it might happen in US. It might happen in UK. But there are some developing countries which will be very, very interested to enter the industry of self-driving cars. And if the most developed countries will neglect from uh, entering, that's a chance for those countries uh, like Brazil, uh, uh, countries from Asia, maybe even Poland. Like, uh, if I would, uh, if I was a politician, I would say that that's probably a good idea to be like innovator in this area because uh, you, you can have a. Uh, a good uh, a good start uh, to become a, a big player in the industry. Okay, the second challenge that could happen is uh, uh, challenges on the uh, legislative le level. Uh, I don't know if you recognize the uh, the picture here, but that's a depiction of uh, one of the laws that was introduced at the beginning of 20th century in the UK. So what the law would say is it was actually called a red red flag law. And what it would say is that, okay, you can use uh, uh, horseless uh, carriages, because that's how the, uh, the cars were uh, named at that point. However, you need a person that will be walking in front of the car, waving red flag. So you can imagine how annoying that was. And the real purpose of the, uh, of the law was to stop cars entering the market. And this is something that can happen uh, uh, for the self-driving cars as well. However, as I said, I do not really believe that that will be something that will happen on a global scale. I believe that there will be lobbying, there will be a market pressure, there will be some weird laws uh, passing. Uh, however, I think that that will be constrained, uh, hopefully, to a single single country. <coughs> okay. Next thing that is questionable or that can be a challenge uh, is, as weird as it might seem, ethics. So uh, the self-driving car will be something which uh, works in a deterministic way. So it means that implicitly or explicitly, all rules of operations will be uh, embedded in the software. So somebody who is designing the software will need to figure out what should happen in given scenarios. And one of the uh, problems that uh, exists is that uh, humans, or my belief is that humans have uh, intuition when it comes to ethics. They know what is good or what is bad. However, it's very hard to uh, precisely 
state the rules that we are driven by. And this is an example of that. It's called the trolley problem. Let's say that we have two situations. The first situation is this. A trolley is running out of control down a track. In its path are five people who have been tied to the track by a bad philosopher. Fortunately, you could flip a switch which will lead the trolley down a different uh, track to safety. Unfortunately, there is a single person tied to that track. Should you flip the switch or not? And uh, what uh, research shows is that most of the people will say, I will flip the switch. Like, it makes more sense to basically kill one person than four people. So, like, I agree with that. It's, uh, it's intuitive for me. Now, we have a variation of that problem, which says, okay, you have only one truck, still four people, but you are on a bridge with an extremely fat guy. And what you can do is you can get the guy and throw him off the bridge. He will fall down on the tracks and stop the train. And now the question is, will you like push the guy out of the bridge? And most people would say, no, I'm not going to push him. And the interesting fact about that is that it's very, very hard to justify why the answer by most people to the first question is yes, and the answer to the second question is no. Like, from mathematical perspective, it's like four to one still, right? But like for some reason, we are not, not doing that. Yeah. I believe I know the answer. Yeah, uh, they are probably not strong enough to pull that guy. <laughs> yeah, that, that that might be <laughs> that might be the case. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> okay, but but I hope that it gives you the idea that like some things are not that like explicit and not very easy to like put into rules. Like uh, we can go even further with that. Let's assume that I'm driving a service. I don't know if that's actually uh, right to say I'm driving. Like I'm in a self-driving car, which is going uh, through the road. I have exactly the same situation, but I have 10 people on a bus station, and I have my child on the other side, and I'm not controlling the car that I'm like driving, right? And like, what should be the outcome of of the decision made by the system? Like, it's tricky. It's tricky. What what should be the right answer? And uh, yeah. And now the question is, okay, uh, if we have such problems as that, uh, how the software should be written to actually cope with those problems. Now, I truly believe that this is a problem, but I think that there is a second argument which might be good uh, to put forward against that. And uh, the argument is that if you look at the statistics, it makes more sense to uh, have 10 times less people dying because of the safety of the self-driving car than have this like border cases in which like the decision is questionable. The other argument against that would be, okay, but there are systems which are like <coughs> operating on their own right now. Like in Dubai, you have a subway which is running on their own, right? Uh, you have a lot of systems which are, uh, which are potential threat to a, uh, to a human life, but still, uh, still, they are operating, and so, somehow they are figuring out what are the border border cases. Maybe it's not expli explicitly stated in the software, but still, like it operates in in some manner. Okay, and the last challenge is uh, is technology. Like I I put it here only for the purpose of argument, to be honest, because as I said, I, I believe that the technology will be there, but potentially we might have a problem. Uh, we might have a problem with delivering a reliable self-driving car. And one of the arguments, like concrete arguments, would be, okay, if we need a high precision maps of the reality, uh, that can be a challenge. Right now, Google has, uh, to my knowledge, about uh, two and a half thousand miles of roads mapped, where in the US alone, there is uh, more than uh, two million uh, miles of roads. So, like, the difference is huge, but Still, I believe that this is just work that can be done. It's just a matter of time and, and effort needed to, uh, to succeed. OK, so uh, this is everything that I wanted to show you today. Uh, I hope that uh, I managed to, to make an argument that self-driving car technology is something that will happen. And there are good reasons that it will happen. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, I'm not really convinced that th mm -hmm. this will happen uh, because I believe it might be easier to create some, I don't know, flying automatic transportation. Yes. Yeah. So everyone would have 
not a one person car, but one person copter or something like that, mm -hmm. and would fly everywhere. Uh, it would work almost the same, but it has a huge advantage because our uh, roads right now are really polluted because of trees, paths, and all that stuff. And our air is mostly free in some distance above mm -hmm. the ground. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I like, uh, I agree. But, so, uh, 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 yeah, go on. But don't you see the pattern? No one, no one is investing in those, you know, flying. Yes, boats. yes, so, I agree. Uh, uh, the answer is could be simple that it uh, has no use. It's fun to imagine so science fiction, but you know it might depend uh, on the fact that cars are rather common and everyone uses the car, and the aviation is not as common for everyone. Uh, but I believe it might be easier to use this okay. this way. Okay. I don't know. If okay, so, so so I would say that uh, I I think that we both agree that there there will be self like driven flying something. And uh, now the question is whether it will be a car or a, a flying object. I think that that's questionable and like there are different scenarios which are possible. However, I think that the benefits and the impact will be more or less the same. And I agree that with the flying thing, probably the benefits will be bigger. Now, uh, the, argue, the, the practical argument that I would make is that uh, the automotive industry for end user is way more in a, like developed than, uh, the, than the flying counterpart. And if you look at the uh, time horizon, uh, the technology will be available for the user way sooner, right? So it might be so that, okay, in 2030, we will be driving self-driven self cars, but like 20, 20 years from there, we will be flying something which will be controlled uh, externally as well. So uh, I would say that uh, those are things that do not necessarily like contradict each other. It might be so that... I think the planes are right now really in a state that we will be with the cars in like 10 years because they can learn by themselves, they can start by themselves. So actually that's, that, that's a good argument. And to my knowledge, uh, there is no single uh, airplane that can start on its own. Uh, uh, so, okay, like, th so they taking off start? is always manual. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but most of the like uh, things they do, they can do like on autopilot mode. So in reality, we are on a state that we will be with the cars like in 2025. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 that's like for public transportation. Uh, what I meant is that there are not that many people who own like flying object for themselves. Like, yeah. uh, like everyone has a car. Only a few people have their own planes. So like, I think that does the difference. You would have to uh, like bring like commodity uh, flying unit to, to people, which is not, not here yet, I yeah. believe. Yeah, and the problem with technology, because we already have the platform for self-driving cups. You can attach uh, sensors from Google to any car, and, and it works. And the problem is rather algorithmic than the technological, but with yeah, self flying uh, uh, self-flying, let's say, cars. Uh, we don't have the technology now. Don't so even uh, use it manually. Flying is just uh, and it's because more, more difficult. We don't yeah. have, yeah, but we don't have a cheap enough engine to to use uh, yeah. in this kind of solution. So that's the problem from technological point of view. But there is a case uh, the drones. Right yeah, now. the drones they are, are getting more popular, and you can buy drone for about ten thousand. Yeah, so and is it, is it possible to lift them? Man, it can lift nothing except itself. So yeah, yeah. 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 Huge rotors. That's the problem. We do, we do not have cheap enough engine to use. Yeah, cool. We do not have uh, good enough technology for self-driving cars as well. So it, it no, is the actually case we, have, we, we have, have. We have. Yeah. We have the platform. Just uh, we need to figure out algorithm to actually, I don't know, figure out traffic lights or uh, or something. But the algorithm is the technology, I believe. No, we have uh, the technology. We have a car like a oh, machine, but, but you don't have a drone big enough to lift you, but you yes. have a car. Yes, yes, I so you they are way more no, energy. No. Uh, we have drones able to lift me, but they are not as cheap as cars, right? Yeah, so, 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 like, so I, I would say that, money. like, my opinion is that it's a matter of time, like, difference of time. I believe that probably we'll have a technology for flying, like, moving, uh, moving people in the air. However, that's, like, 
maybe not way further in time, but definitely like a couple of years. So uh, I think that the self-driving cars as a like uh, mechanical thing uh, will be will be available sooner. I'm a bit skeptical about uh, so, you know, introducing this, this uh, self-driving cars because uh, you know we are programmers mostly and uh, there are software bugs, uh, <laughs> there are viruses, there are hacker attacks, mm -hmm. and uh, if you think about it. The safety level. Uh, uh, where where do you people, keep your money? <laughs> exactly. That's just the thing yeah, you will need to do. Okay? Yeah, um, but 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 we, but you are talking people, about like a subway system, <laughs> uh, a train system, system or a flying airplane. Example, because uh, usually there's a driver. Uh, no, but, subway no. system. Yeah, but subway system. In more so, well, the second line of four, so subway, there will be that automated train. Subway, yes. <laughs> but, but on the second line, no, but yeah, the subway is very in London, then, in London, there is a train that moves without any like uh, drivers inside. Okay, it's it totally automatic. Yeah, but uh, and for it's for public place, transport. Uh, they are almost able to take off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Think, so, pilot, but, but there is a still need for pilots because so yeah, people are I, reacting better in surprising conditions, and you, you. Yeah, but I think your whole argument is invalid because uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the point of you know developing? For example, it would be easier to say that you know boats are easier than uh, safer than planes. I'm just talking that people will not. We, uh, my point is that we can't we, we, we can't escape from it. We just need to embrace it and uh, you know figure out and deal with it with I the think problems. You're right, that people are better at reacting to surprises, but the surprises are there mostly because of people. Like the Google Heart oh, car has two crashes. Yeah. Because of other people. If there are no other people, the cars would be able to drive perfectly with each other. Yeah, but for, for example, there are some surprising road conditions. For example, after heavy rain, some part of the road collapses and your car will just fall down because no, because there is no uh, software patch for your car. No. Okay. okay, so so, so it, there, are, there are vacuum cleaners that will not fall down from yeah, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> and that can clean it. Yeah. So it works. We have this technology now. So so currently, did. currently our uh, infrastructure is uh, is designed for uh, human drivers. And uh, when we are talking about uh, advances in technology in cars, we also probably will have some kind of technology to put on the roads. I would be some sensor yeah. and, and so on. So the car won't be only seen, but we'll be communicating with the road actually. So, so it would eliminate a lot of those things. So one more comment, one more comment from my side. And actually, to my knowledge, there will be a second presentation done in the Distinguished Engineer series, which will be about deep learning technologies, and that will be de de delivered uh, by Chris. And uh, maybe I'm like spoiling uh, his presentation, but uh, I know about one of the examples when uh, the deep learning algorithm was used and it performed better than any human being. And the task at which it performed better was recognizing cuts on uh, photographs. And it, like, it seems weird, right? Like we are humans who are like genetically or evolutionally wired to see faces, but still we are able to create artificial intelligence algorithm, which is able at that task than us. So like, I think that in very narrow uh, uh, narrow tasks, uh, which can be combined together, computers will become better than people are right now. And even in such things that uh, appear to us very, very natural, natural like uh, looking at faces, right? Right now, there are algorithms which are better at that than human. Than any human. The, 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 these are stand-up algorithms, not quantum algorithms. So yeah, that's the quantum, quantum. Quantum computers and algorithms, we've got many, many more possibilities. Yeah, and actually, there we talk about quantum computers as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So I think that that we are done. Thank you very much for your patience.